Very good morning to everyone who is here today. Thank you for joining us this morning uh, for our fifth lecture in our aviation lecture series. So uh, my name is Kelvin. Hey, I'm based here in Singapore for the Asia campus of uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And with us here today uh, is David Cerui, and he will be presenting on a very interesting topic. He, uh, you guys will be learning uh, how to you know, design, create, and fly a virtual aircraft. So this session today is the fifth in a series of six lectures. They are designed to break down the world of aviation into you know, bite-sized pieces that you can easily understand. But we have one more session, our last, okay, um, on the 31st of August. Okay, uh, before we hand this okay, over to David, we would just like to remind you of the following guidelines for this session. Now, uh, if you have joined us previously, you will know that we would like you to mute your microphone okay, and to not interrupt the speaker while he is presenting and uh, talking. Um, do try to refrain from the digressing from the lecture topic in the chat. If you have any question you'd like to ask, uh, you can post in the chat or raise your hand okay, using the raise your hand function and wait for our speaker here to give you the go ahead. Now, uh, after, the, after the presentation and session, we uh, would be happy to stay on okay, uh, to answer any questions you might have about our programs uh, and things like our admission process. So if you, if you want to, you can just stay on uh, after this session or okay, contact us using our contact information that you can see here on the screen. Give us a call, check out our website, you know, or drop us an email. And of course, if you have not already done so, feel free to follow us on our social media. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, on Twitter. Okay, so you can get the latest information uh, on our upcoming activities and events that we are hosting and conducting uh, throughout the year. Right now, I would just like to pass control back to David. And David, you have control. Thank you, Kelvin. Thank you very much. Class, uh, I'm excited about being here today. My name is uh, David Cerulli. And uh, let me share my screen so we can start off uh, the session. Uh, yeah, so I have a background in aviation. I spent my whole career working. I'm currently an adjunct professor here on the, the, the campus and uh, I was helping support them in development of their small UAS initiatives here, along with aeronautics and uh, cargo management and other hosts of both courses. It looks like uh, this is a fifth session in the, this series, Ready, Set, Fly, and the topics seem to be extremely interesting. Uh, my colleagues presented things on freakonomics, pop culture, and uh, even who owns the airspace nowadays, um, where, that, where that's heading to. But today, we're going to talk a little bit about how to design and develop a small UAS. What are the implications? Uh, what you need to do uh, to build it? And then we're actually going to jump into a virtual lab and do the construction of a small UAS uh, through some design principles that we're going to talk about. Once we've built that UAS, then we're going to go in and actually fly it in a simulator uh, with a real flight plan to test out the performance of that UAS and our knowledge on how to uh, operate UAS safely. So with that, uh, the course, the, today's lecture is going to be a little bit, maybe a little bit different than the other ones. We're going to be very hands-on, very much uh, like a course if you're attending university here. So uh, with that, you can see uh, the splash screen uh, is talking about the different modules and uh, the application that we use here is called Canvas. It's a learning management system and we're going to be using the structure as a guide to walk us through the this lecture today but a lot of the input is going to come from you the students in terms of directing us to the making the decisions the design decisions and then figuring out how to put a UAS together and then execute that so if there aren't any questions uh just a, a few items in zoom we have thumbs up thumbs down we'll use that quite often for uh, understanding uh, and getting responses. Feel free to put notes in the chat. My colleagues will direct me uh, with uh, notes for questions that, that apply uh, at this point in time. Uh, and we'll do some sharing and hopefully have a little fun. So if there's any questions, I'd like to 
start out getting to know my students a little bit, getting to know my class. So one thing I like to do is I'd like to propose a survey and Vanessa or Kevin, if you could bring up questionnaire one, please. And that questionnaire deals with, it's uh, an interesting topic. I found that uh, if I, we can go through here, read through this list and then select one answer that most identifies with you to the kind of vehicle or, uh, that you would like to drive. Let's see if you could, yes. Which car would you like to drive? Kind of get a composition of my classroom and see where we're at. Hmm, looking good. We have a lot of people going for the need for speed, definitely. But also performance sedan. Oh, we're going for luxury. Everybody's nowadays in, very interested in the Tesla, for sure. All right, with more than 80% of the votes in the polling, it looks like uh, we have a pretty rounded out group here. 34% uh, is looking for the need for speed. So I'm ready to see if we can get on the open road. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the new Corvette, but it seems like it's going to be one of the uh, hottest cars out there. Uh, Eco-friendly, thumbs up to everyone out there. Good job. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I had and drove a Honda, a Honda Civic Hybrid uh, for many years. Uh, very, very, very nice car. And the performance sedan, uh, yeah, that's still in the forefront for me. Uh, I'm more of a simple SUV guy uh, and a van guy. So thank you all for starting out there. I hope that's reflective of the kind of designs and things that we're gonna be uh, developing here. Uh, as you come to realize, one of the areas that uh, are really important in terms of aircraft design is the mission. And the mission comes back to what do you wanna do with this? How do you wanna do it? And where do you wanna do it? So behind me, I can point appropriately that airplane back there that's called a high altitude platform. It's uh, currently under flight test. It was designed and developed out of a company in Simi, uh, California. It is about 100 meters long and maybe, maybe seven meters wide. So it's a huge flying wing. Its mission is to stay aloft for six months at a time flying at altitudes between 60 and 80,000 feet. 60, 80,000 feet with a flight time of six months. So yeah, there's not too many airplanes, even though we have commercial flights today that go well beyond anything that we've seen in up to 20 hours long, flights from Singapore to Newark nonstop, now from Australia to the States nonstop. Uh, this airplane will be able to be operated at those altitudes for six months. So the mission was, was very important in terms of how it was designed and the utilization. It will provide communications to regions it flies over where it's rural and remote and you're unable to attach to cell towers because there's no, no cell towers to attach to. So it's different than a satellite in that it flies at, at lower altitudes, just above commercial airspace, and it takes off and land. So your payloads can continually be updated as technology progresses. So it's a competing technology to satellite communications that's very much in the forefront of providing regional broadband and telecom services. So I don't know if anybody has any questions so far uh, on the importance of that, of the mission. If not, uh, let's 
move on and walk through Canvas. Now, can I get a thumbs up from the group on uh, who's used a learning ma management system during the circuit breaker? Did your school uh, provide any element learning management system? Do, were you online at all? Can I see some thumbs up, thumbs down? Yeah, there we go. We got, looks like we got one or two people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, very good, very good, very good, very good. So, to, to some of you, this may not be new. Uh, to other ones, uh, this may be like, wow, what is this? So we're going to take just a few seconds before we get started to actually go through this configuration so you can get a feel for uh, a methodology for uh, organizing and delivering your classroom. This is the way I like to do it. Other teachers, other instructors can have different vehicles, different methodologies. One's not right or wrong. Uh, they're just uh, a little bit different. I come from a very engineering focused background. I'm kind of a geek at heart. So for me, I love this structure. It, it provides to you uh, a home page, uh, a place to make announcements uh, to the class so they, everyone can see it. It also comes with a series of modules, which is an organized structure how to deliver the class. So I'm using this today for my lecture. So in this, in this course, there's basically uh, a starting point, which is all the background of what the course is about, what the lecture is about, and in, in, it's easy to include different things like this Aerial Robotics Virtual Lab, ARLV application. It's an Embry-Riddle application that was developed by Dr. Uh, Twindler. And he built this in uh, as a teaching method for advancing both design and consideration and design concepts for students as they come in to the UAS technologies. So the platform is built around modules. So the first module is design and configuration for fixed wing airplanes. We also have a module for VTOL and other airplanes, such as tail draggers, all right, and, and traditional helicopters, quadcopters and traditional helicopters. We have extensive information that goes into the composition and decomposition of the component parts for that, for a UAS. And then we, we get into the heart of where we're going to step into next, because this is a simple 90-minute uh, lecture. The, a course like this might occur over four to eight weeks, typically. And we're going to jump in and talk a little bit more about what goes in to developing and designing an airplane. So before we get started on this, I have another poll, because we have to start thinking about the mission. OK, let's think about the mission. So from a design uh, philosophical question, can we pull up question five, uh, the poll for that, please? We're going to go through three questions, and it help us quantify as a group what do we want to do with our course today in terms of building the UAS. So this makes it quite dynamic, because I don't have a script now after this point to walk us through the rest of the course. You're, the students are driving the course. And I think that's one thing as you experience Embry-Riddle University, the teaching method is very interactive between the instructor and the students, the students to student coordination. We do teamwork in, in terms of developing, designing, sharing information. So today this is very, very typical of how we would move through a course or session of a class. All right, uh, with 70% of the polls in, we have, looks like search and rescue is by far the leading contender. So we're gonna mark that down, search and rescue airplane. Yep, very good. Okay, so now if we're gonna build a search and rescue airplane, let's go to question six. I believe that one, it deals with what kind of 
locations are we going to design this air airplane to? Because you could do search and rescue in many different locations, and your design, your mission, uh, your airplane may be uh, sensitive to the locations. So let's say, let's decide a location for search and rescue. It seems all these places could have uh, application. <laughs> okay, we have some characters out in the student body there, of course. Everybody knows where infinity and beyond came from, right? Yeah, Buzz Lightyear. All right. Votes are coming in, votes are coming in. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, we're closing in with 80% of the polls now registered. We can predict the, the winner for this election. Here we go, here we go. It is a close, the, it wasn't a close call for second, but first place is definitely forest, jungle, Forest, jungle, deserts. I threw that in there because I used to live uh, in the deserts uh, back in the States before I moved to Singapore. And the mountains. Uh, gotta love the Rocky Mountains and all Punta Kinabalu here over in um, Malaysia. Just wonderful places to go visit. All right, so we know we're gonna build a search and rescue drone and we're targeting it. We're gonna design it to operate in a forest, jungle, mountainous region. All right, not in a region that has lots of services. It's key, key, very good, very good. All right, so the last question that we wanna ask ourselves then is really, when we're designing the stone, if you could bring up uh, the pole four, what is going to be the trade-offs? The trade-offs, and in the trade-offs, there are key factors in designing aircraft. So let's pull up poll four, and we're gonna determine whether speed, payload, flight time, or distance traveled is the most important design factor for, for our drone, our application of our drone, for our mission. Ooh. Thank you students for participating in the polls. We're getting a great, great reception here. All right. Wow, with 90% of the time, this was very, very, a lot closer. We want to be able to travel the farthest distance. And then a very close second is time. Now, these two terms in aviation have very specific ter uh, terminology. For flight time, the, the way to achieve flight time is something called max endurance. And there's actually calculations that you can be made to determine the best speed to fly your, your, your particular UAV for the most time. Conversely, flying an airplane for the most amount of time, that speed doesn't take you the longest distance. Let me repeat that. Flying an airplane for the most amount of time doesn't take you the longest distance. The terminology there is your range. You wanna go for max range. So there are actually two speeds that are very important for airplanes. One is staying up loft to max time. Two, is distance travel, and they're two separate speeds. They don't work the same. So as we design our airplane, this is probably one of the key parts that we're gonna to have to consider, distance versus time. Payload, of course, is always important, and obviously speed, the faster you can go, is typically better in a mission, but we always wanna bound that by the end goals. All right, very good. I think we're doing well here. We have uh, an airplane designed uh, for the most part. Let's go see where we're gonna go with this. So uh, I think right now we need 
could dive in and kind of understand some of the basic principles associated with airplanes. All right. So with that, I'm going to go through a short lecture with has, has a number of videos associated with it that's going to talk about airplanes, airplane designs, and what and how you how you go about doing it. I call it what comes up must come down. Close the poll. So what you're seeing here is excerpts of students, actual students work, okay? Uh, at Embry-Riddle, we do a lot of team assignments uh, where you have interactions with your students. There's a lot of learning uh, that you go through by exploring, experience, and then presenting the information. It's just not reading and memorizing here at Embry-Riddle. So this is the class, the excerpts are coming out uh, this team. Uh, and if they're online today, hello to my, my students. And obviously, this is the first slide on how planes fly, right? Fantastic. We have a little bit of air coming in the front and a little bit of magic going on around that. Then a little bit more air coming into the engines and some more magic. And then some very important magic where the air goes over the wings. And then the last, we have air going over these, this tail section here for, to provide control. So this is a little tongue in cheek, obviously, but it, yeah, so the layman, how airplanes fly can seem very magical, but really isn't. So we're gonna introduce you today to the four forces that make up in, uh, airplane flight. Boom. First subject that we need to talk about is this guy, Sir Isaac Newton. End of the 16th century, beginning of the seven, uh, 17, 1700s, he came up with a lot of smart ideas, actually three, three theories. But one of them says, if you don't disturb something in constant motion, it will stay in constant motion. Now, on, when we're close to Earth, we have gravity pulling us to the ground. So an airplane needs to fight the gravity. But if you're out in outer space, it says, if you started moving where there's no gravity and no, very little or no friction, you'll just keep moving. So that, we have four forces that we're gonna talk about, and they work hand in hand, hand in hand. One, one force relates to the next force, which relates to the, the first force. So we're gonna start out and watch a, a video clip here. Uh, as you're watching this, I would definitely want you to think about what it means to have balanced forces. Give me a thumbs up if the sounds, uh, okay. While an airplane is in flight, there are four forces acting upon it. They are lift, weight, thrust, and drag. Lift is the upward force created by the wings as air flows around them and keeps the airplane in the air. Weight is the downward force toward the center of the earth, opposite lift, which exists due to gravity. Next, we have thrust. This is the forward force, generally created by the aircraft's propellers or turbine engines, which pulls or pushes the aircraft through the air. Finally, there is drag. Drag is the force, acting in the direction opposite of thrust, which fundamentally limits the performance of the airplane. When an aircraft is maintaining its heading, altitude, and airspeed, it is said to be in straight and level, unaccelerated flight. In unaccelerated flight, lift equals weight and thrust equals drag. Fantastic. So, uh, the big takeaway there, when you're in unaccelerated flight, going back to Newton's theory, where you have constant speed, lift equals weight and thrust equals drag. There we go. So let's talk about the first, uh, first item, all right? Uh, lift. And now we're definitely not talking about the elevator, uh, but we, it is a, one of the most important uh, factors in aviation. So as we discussed in the video, lift is the opposite 
four set uh, handles uh, uh, to weight, and it basically holds the airplane in the air. Okay, now there's two key parts to lift. And at this time, we're gonna make a short digression over to the topic I call my friend Bernoulli. We need to talk about Bernoulli's principle. So I'm going to jump over there. And we're going to talk, go quickly go through Bernoulli's principle. Again, what you're seeing class is classwork from, uh, excerpts of classwork from uh, my actual class here. Uh, this team went through and uh, wanted to teach the rest of the class, what is this Bernoulli guy? What is it all about? So Bernoulli was born at the beginning of the 1700s. So he had a little bit of overlap with Newton, probably was in school when uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton was uh, a senior, uh, and then uh, lived for about 80 years, which is pretty phenomenal for that day and age. So up there you can see he's, he's Dutch, even though he looks like he has a, a Italian name, so I always uh, thought he was a, a fellow Italian, but uh, no, he was Dutch born and he's a Swiss physicist. And then here's the terms, he's a uh, hydrodynamics, He's kinetic of theories of gas and aerodynamics. So out of the group, can I get a thumbs up if you ever heard of this guy, Daniel Bernoulli? Yeah, one guy, Josh, thanks. Oh, whoa, everybody's here. Must be, have a bunch of, a bunch of aeronautical engineers. Yes, we John Cole, nice to see you. All right, so this is Bernoulli. These are the big things he, do, he did. But to me, he did this. He put the math together that says, when you put your thumb over the hose, the water comes out faster and you can squirt people farther. Tongue in cheek, but that's what this guy proved. And his proof looks like this. Yes, we're not gonna go deep into this formula, but this is his formula where it's a kind of a conservation of energy and volume. It says, when you have a pipe and water goes through it, if it's going at one speed and you constrain it, you put your thumb over the hose, it goes faster. And then if you leave it go, it goes, it returns back to your normal speed. The key here that makes aviation happen is what happens when you speed it up. The difference between P1 and P2, okay? P2, the pressure decreases, all right? We need to remember that the pressure decreases. So that makes a lot of effect. So the implications of that really go wide and far. It's making these kind of airplanes be able to fly and do the missions that they're intent intended to do based upon the shape of the wings. So Daniel told us all birds need to, uh, to fly are the right shape wings, the right pressure, and the right angle. If you guys have any questions now, to, uh, please go bring it up. So we know about Daniel Bernoulli. So let's go back. Let's go back and see what does this mean in terms of lift? Because he's a key player in the lift, uh, understanding lift. All right, so we're back here. We went through uh, Daniel, his, his contribution into aviation and land lift. And here we go. I got another short video for you that describes the lift. And what I need you to do while you're watching this video is can you see where Bernoulli fits in, fits in so uh, ideally with aviation? This is probably the best explanation I've ever seen uh, Bernoulli's, equation, uh, Bernoulli's equation in aviation. The key to an aircraft being able to fly is lift.
Looking at a cross section of a wing, we can better understand how the lift gets generated. A wing is a type of airfoil. Airfoils, in general, are just any surface that generates an aerodynamic force as a fluid. In our case, air moves around it. Don't confuse a fluid with a liquid. Fluids are any substance that deform under an applied stress. Liquids, gases, and plasmas are all considered fluids. In addition to the wings, all the flight control surfaces, as well as the propeller, are considered airfoils. Uh, the aircraft's fuselage is even an airfoil, but it's not very good at producing lift. Before we get too in-depth, let's introduce a few new terms. The forwardmost point of the wing is called the leading edge. The aftmost point is called the trailing edge. If we connect these two edges together with an imaginary line, this line is called the cord line. As an airplane flies through the air, the path that the plane travels along is known as its flight path. The airflow that flows around the airplane as it travels through the air is known as the relative wind. The relative wind is parallel to, but opposite, the aircraft's flight path. The angle between the wing's cord line and the aircraft's relative wind is called the aircraft's angle of attack. The angle of attack is a major factor as to how much lift the wings generate. So now that we've got those terms out of the way, how does a wing actually create lift? Well, there are two major theories working in unison that explain the creation of lift. These are Newton's three laws of motion and Bernoulli's principle. While all three laws of motion apply to flight, the third law has the most significance to lift production. Newton's third law states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. If you stick your hand out of a moving car's window, you will notice that your hand will want to lift up. By rotating your hand, you are deflecting the air that comes in contact with your hand downward. And as a result, the air will push your hand up. This is similar to how a wing works. In normal flight, as air flows around the wing, the air gets deflected downward as it flows smoothly around it. And as a result, the wind will lift the wing up. The other main theory of lift is Bernoulli's principle. Watch this. This the principle states, as the velocity of a fluid, in this case air, increases, its internal pressure decreases. We can visualize this by having air flow through a tube with a narrower middle section, which we call a venturi. As air enters the tube, it is traveling at a known velocity and pressure. When it arrives at the narrower portion, the velocity increases to allow the air through. As the air's velocity increases, the air's pressure decreases. Then, as the air exits the narrower portion, it returns back to its original velocity and pressure. Now, let's flatten the top part of the tube. Granted, the effect will not be as pronounced, but there will still be a change in velocity and pressure as the air moves through. Now, how does this relate to a wing? Well, if we replace the bottom protrusion of the tube with a wing, in essence, we have the same thing as a venturi. As the air passes over the wing, each layer of air gets deflected less and less until finally, we reach a layer where the air is not disturbed at all from the wing. This can be thought of as the top of the venturi. An airplane's wing is shaped similar to that of a venturi. The top is rounded while the bottom is relatively flat. Because of this, the air traveling over the wing will increase in speed and, as a result, will have a lower pressure than the air below the wing. This imbalance in pressure is called a pressure gradient. Wings are designed to create this kind of pressure gradient because air always moves from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. Since the wing is stuck in between the two areas of unequal pressure, it is lifted towards the area of low pressure by the force of the higher pressure air trying to move to the low pressure side of the wing. Now that we've covered the two theories behind lift, let's discuss all the factors that determine how much Okay. So, were there any questions on that? I know it was a, a little bit of a long segment, but I wanted to go through and let them formulate how a wing is actually the shallow part of the venturi tube uh, and how we actually create lift by the pressure underneath 
the wing being higher than the pressure on top of it. So it's literally a pushing uh, a force up. Vanessa or Kevin, Kelvin, is there anybody out there that has any questions at the point? Okay, so if we're good to go with that, let's go through one last bit of math and mathematical equation because it becomes a foundation for some of our design, understanding how to make design principles. Because remember, all these four forces interact. So the lift formula has some very simple parts. There it is, it, it has a couple key parts. First of all, it's very close to the energy. So it works off of mass and, and uh, speeds where the velocity is uh, critically important. So the first guy that we're gonna take a peek at is the coefficient of lift. As the coefficient of lift goes up, the angle of attack goes up, your lift goes up. So the shape of your wing, just like in the bird case from Bernoulli, to, to the application is critical to understand how much lift you can have. So the shape and the amount of the wing are key factor parts to it. What else can you change? The angle of attack and how fast you're going. Two critical parts. The faster you go, the less angle of attack the, uh, you need and the less wing area you need to create the same amount of lift out of the squared factor. And the last one is the, the composition of the air mass you're in. The viscosity, the temperature, the density associated with the air mass. Now, for the most part, compressibility for the, uh, the realms of flight that we typically work in in commercial aviation uh, that our small UAS will work in, it's non-compressible. But as you get to supersonic flight, compressibility makes uh, a bigger and bigger factor. So remember this question, uh, equation. You have size, you have shape, and you have speed. Okay, the next force, weight. With weight, uh, obviously, it's going to be the, uh, the, it takes on the characteristics of lift having to overcome it. So lift and weight have to be in balance for the airplane to stay afloat. So let's hear a little bit about what, what weight characteristics are. Weight. weight is the force of gravity pulling the aircraft back down to the earth. This force always acts vertically downward to the center of the Earth, no matter what the aircraft's attitude. The weight force always extends and pivots from the center of gravity, also known as its CG. Keep in mind that the weight of an aircraft is not constant. It will vary with the equipment that is installed, as well as the passengers, cargo, and fuel. Throughout the flight, the weight will slowly be decreasing as fuel is burned to power the engine. Oh, ah, so. Next is thrust. Thrust is the forward. So, did you catch that last part there? I wanted you to look out for that. Uh, the weight of the airplane can change over time. For an airplane that operates off of fuel, but think about this, with the small UAVs, small UAS, many of them are battery driven. So in our design analysis that we're gonna come up to, we need to figure out which power plant is going to give us the correct formulation for our mission. So a typical airplane mission has fuel, fuel to take off, some reserves in case things don't go right. Then this middle part here, deals with the payload. Now, on a commercial airplane, you have cargo and passengers and baggage, of course. For us, our payload will be different. For search and rescue, we'll have different kinds of payloads. Uh, ISR or maybe emergency services. And then you have the weight of the airplane. So that total composition of all these elements becomes the takeoff weight. And remember, takeoff weight has to be overcome by the wings or the, the surfaces. So let's move on to the next one. Now, the last one we're gonna talk about is, uh, uh, second last one is gonna be uh, thrust. The engine. Next is thrust. Thrust is the forward acting force, opposing drag, which propels the airplane through the air. In most general aviation airplanes, thrust is generated from the propeller. 
Larger jets get their thrust from their turbine engines. Similar to lift, thrust is generated from the same principles as lift, but in a horizontal direction. A propeller is an airfoil. As such, as it rotates, its blades accelerate the surrounding air towards the aft end of the aircraft. And as illustrated with Newton's third law, the equal and opposite reaction results in the aircraft moving forward. And finally, we Okay, did everyone catch that? We reach our thrust is a key part, right? And here's a commercial airplane. Our US small US is going to be nothing like this, but uh, yeah, this airplane can create 310,000 pounds of thrust. That's an Antoff 225, uh, recently refurbished and uh, just was recommissioned. Uh, as uh, one of the cargo ca uh, carriers for, uh, to help support the, the global pandemic. So the last one we're going to uh, talk to Pop is drag, and then we're going to get start our design. So let's talk, uh, listen a little bit about what drag is. Finally, we reach our last force, drag. Drag is the force opposing thrust, which limits the forward speed of an aircraft. This, there are two types of drag, parasite and induced drag. Parasite drag is a direct result of the air resistance as the airplane flies through the air. There are three types of parasite drag, form drag, interference drag, and skin friction drag. To learn about these three types, check out the bonus video on parasite drag. The amount of parasite drag varies with the speed of the aircraft. As the airplane's speed increases, the amount of parasite drag will increase. In fact, the amount of parasite drag you experience is directly proportional to the square of the airspeed. For example, an aircraft traveling at 120 knots will experience four times as much parasite drag as the same plane going 60 knots at the same altitude. The other kind of drag is lift-induced drag, more commonly called induced drag. While the wing is creating lift, behind the wing is a downwash of air. At the same time, the airflow around the wingtips are creating vortices that spiral from below the wing to above the wing. As these vortices wrap around the wing, they actually change the downwash angle of the air flowing over the wing. This, in effect, tilts the direction of the lift created backwards. This shift from completely vertical lift to slightly aft lift is due to induced drag. Induced drag is higher at slower air speeds and decreases as we increase speed. This is because induced drag is worse when the airplane is flying at a high angle of attack, like when we are flying slowly. One way that a pilot can experience reduced induced drag is by flying in ground effect. When flying within a wingspan of the ground, the ground itself changes the downwash of the air flowing over the wings. This shifts the lift vector forward and reduces the amount of induced drag. Pilots can take advantage of ground effect when performing a soft field takeoff. This lets the airplane lift off the ground before the regular liftoff speed. However, they'll need to hover over the ground for a few seconds to increase their speed before they can continue to climb. All righty, all righty, all right. I'm out. If we take both in... All right, so there's our references for that work, piece of work. So let's get back to the course. Uh, hi, David. Right. Uh, before we proceed on, I think we have uh, maybe two questions. Okay. So, someone would like uh, you to repeat the topic of leaf and explain stalling. What was it? The topic of what? The topic of lift. Oh, sure, sure. Let's go back to lift. Uh, was it the equation? So the four forces that come into play for lift, and we'll go to the equation again. So the equation of lift, it's the force that has to counter the weight. So the heavier the airplane, 
the more lift you need to have. So to counteract that, there's really only three things you can do. You can create a wing that has a high lift quotient, correct? You can increase the area of the wing, or you can figure out how to fly faster. But in order to fly faster, you need a larger engine because that produces a thrust. So the key factor here is the wing shape and you optimize the wing shape for the speeds that you want to operate in to create the most lift with the least amount of angle attack and surface area. Because remember that surface area comes into the drag quotient. The more surface area you have, the more parasitic drag you have. And the more angle attack that is in the system, the more induced drag you'll, you'll have. So other than the air mass, the only thing we can affect is the coefficient of lift, which is the shape of the wing, the size of the wing, and the speeds we operate at. Did I cover that? Did that help? I'm not on my... I hope it answers your question to whoever asked it. Okay, the next and one. And the next one is stall and effect of induced drag. Oh, yes, stall, very good question. Stalls uh, is actually based on not only induced drag, but it's, uh, is, is a component of it, but uh, it's, a, it's a really a, a truly a factor of angle of lift, uh, angle of attack. What happens as you increase your angle of your wing to the relative wing, you get to the point to where the shape of the wing, the air can no longer stay attached to it, and the air actually uh, goes turbulent and it separates from the wing. So you, as you get to the point you, where your angle attack increases, your coefficient of lift increases. It keeps it getting better and better until you hit a certain point, somewhere between 15 and 20 degrees. 15, 15 and 20 degrees, that, that point occurs. It's not fixed, but for most wings, it's like 17 or 18 degrees. Once you increase the angle attack above that, the area and the back of the wing stalls, it no longer can stay attached. So you effectively reduce your wing component and you're no longer to, able to create enough lift to counteract the pull of the weight and the airplane goes into a stall. So yes, induced is a component of it, but the major component of it is angle of attack. Did I get your question? Respond to that okay? Yeah, you, the person replied, thank you. So I think those are the two questions that were asked. You may proceed on the next part. Oh, for, perfect. Okay, so we have all the knowledge we need as a class and a design team to start off and build our UAS, all right? But we do need to make a, uh, make a cup a few more decisions. We with the learning we just went through, we need to ask ourselves a few more things now. Uh, can we pull up another poll? I think I would like poll seven. What class of UAS do you think will best fit our operations, our mission? We have four, four classes of UAS. Hi, David. Would you mind uh, providing more information about the different classes of the UAS? The difference in the UASs? Oh, yeah. 
So a fixed wing US is gonna be more like a traditional airplane. The quadcopter is four rotors uh, with uh, very good stability. And then the rotor helicopter is more like your traditional uh, air helicopter with a swash plate and ability to provide uh, longer endurance, longer flight times, and larger payloads. Quadcopters are usually limited, limited in endurance to, due to the power systems are typically electrical power systems. Fixed wings uh, can be either powered or, or electrical. Okay, looks like with 80% of the boat coming in, our search and rescue wants to go with a quadcopter. Now, very good. Now, this is the, probably the fundamental thing where if you were doing this for real, you would have to go and ask yourself some more questions. Because we do want to do search and rescue, but there's two aspects to search and rescue. It's being able to go and provide services via the search and rescue to find people in different locations, mountainous locations, difficult, to, difficult terrain to get into, or there's a search and rescue where you want to go and survey a long period of time. So in, in that effect, you would probably build up something called a CONOPS, uh, op, operational uh, conditions that you want to construct your you, uh, aircraft to that would meet your particular CONOPS. So in this case, the quad cup is just fine. Uh, we, we'll go off and we'll build that and uh, see how it comes, up, comes out. But now we need to make a decision. So the next thing is we need to ask ourselves fixed wing quadcopter. Okay. Let's get into the designing of this UAS. All right. Can everyone see the A Aerial Robotics Virtual Lab? Can I get some thumbs up? Uh, let me check. Is my screen showing? Okay, we got a couple thumbs up. Looking good, looking good. Great, great. This is a design tool uh, built here at Embry Riddle, and it allows us to go through the first level design uh, trade offs in terms of building our search and rescue helicopter, I mean, quadcopter, the, with the, for the forests and jungles with optimum distance. All right. So under the main menu, uh, we're going to quickly walk through this so you get a feel for what we can do, and then we're going to uh, go off and do a build and try to fly it. So you have things, uh, labs, uh, and assemblies, and then screenshots are just in settings, there's just data captures. So let's go into a lab and see what happens in, in a lab. Under this lab, we have five different components that you can go and visit. Uh, one of the biggest ones is the power, power lab kind of the most interesting. And under it, you can select which kind of engines you wanna have, either electric or internal combustion engine. So this is a four cylinder engine on there. Uh, and it's running at sea level at current uh, standard temperature and pressure. All right, so let's take this thing and give it some throttle. Let's uh, run it up to about 60% throttle and uh, see what kind of performance we get out of this engine. It's got 361 uh, cubic inches of, of displacement, uh, idling speed of 700, and max uh, RPMs, which is quite different than a car, right? Of 2,700. Because airplanes are made to operate very fit for very long intervals, very reliably. The more you stress the, the spinning of, a, of an engine, the more wear and tear you're going to have on it. So let's go here. You go and update the outputs. This is a very simple lab. And you can see that we're creating 116 uh, horsepowers and 316 foot pounds of torque and 431 pounds of thrust. Not bad, not bad. So the question becomes, well, we need to operate. Do we want to operate our search and rescue just at sea level? No, we talked about forests, jungles, deserts, and mountains. Well, uh, let's give us a kind of a jungle height. 
1,000 feet. Let's move up to 1,000 feet. Right now, we're generating 431 uh, pounds of thrust. What happens if we take the same engine and move it up to 1,000 feet? <gasps> Lo and behold, look, our power went down to 110 horsepower and our, and our thrust decrease. So what did we just learn there? Can you go to poll two? Excuse me, poll three. Can you put a poll three? We had something happen. Can you put a poll three? I, as a class, I'd like you to take a look at this and try to guess what happened in terms of our power. Ah, oh, okay. I think we have some aeronautical students in, in the lecture today. Ah, oh, very good, very good, very good. Yes, it looks like with 80% of the vote in, it looks like we're, what happens to air density as altitude increases? Yes, it does, it, does, it decreases substantially. So what does that mean? Well, the mixture of fuel and air is, that combustion is what provides the power. As your air decreases in density, your power decreases. So let's take this to an extreme. We want to do a search and rescue on Punta Kitabalu Island, and then can we even get there? And what? We're gonna to have to really be careful. Our horsepowers are down to 63 and our thrust is now to 264 pounds of thrust. So we've really lost a lot of power going up in altitude. And uh, you just got a sneak attack in terms of learning something about the atmosphere and the interaction of combustion engines. If you didn't know that, as you go up in altitude, you, you your power decreases non-linearly, all right? So that's why the different types of engines work in, uh, in different airplanes for different missions. All right, I think that's enough for the labs. We could test different equipment, comms. We can test comms. We can do opticals to do balancing. We can look at the, the dynamics and uh, of what we need to do for airplane equipment that's different than standard equipment uh, through looking at the analysis of the effects of it shaking and rattling. But I think it's time to go build an airplane. What do you say? Are we ready? I think we're ready. Anyone ready to build an airplane? No, not on this one. Oscar, thank you. You want to build any? any? Oh, Aubrey. Hey, yeah, he's been here almost all oh, 40, 50 minutes and we, we haven't built any airplanes. So let's go do it. I'm with you. Somewhere. So we're going to build a quadcopter. Here it goes. So this is a nice setup. I'm able to take the This is a 3D imaging. It allows you to look around the, the quadcopter. Uh, standard kind of quadcopter we can build up. So I populated some things here, but I think oh, what we need to do is make sure we got the right equipment. So up here we can select the engine types. Well, for a quadcopter, it's pretty limited uh, to electrical power systems. So I think we need to bring up, uh, I believe, question five or seven that deals with Vanessa on what the power selection for a quadcopter. Do we want to stick, which motors do we want to put on there? 400 kilovolt electric motor, a uh, small efficient motor, or more powerful motor, which allow us to lift more, but then again, it's going to require more battery, which is more weight. So Vanessa, can you bring up uh, that? I'm trying to get over that. 
I think it's either seven or eight. Yes, uh, 10, sorry, my, my, my apologies. There we go. Oh, I'm so happy. Uh-oh, someone's going for magnokinesis. So yes, we're gonna use the power energy source for the Avengers. All right, it's neck and neck. You may not be able to call a winner at 80%. Oh, yes, we can. It looks like we're going to go with the 500 kilovolt uh, equipment. All right, sounds good. Let's take these motors and uh, plop them on there. It's about as simple as this, doing the, the selection process. Put them on. Get on there. And one more, 580 volts. All right, so now we have some statistics down here. We want to pay attention to these, these guys. because it goes through and it's helping you determine whether you have a balanced system, all right? So right now, our payload uh, that we have on there, uh, the, this current camera is uh, 27 ounces. It looks like, uh, and our sensor package is a, is a, a 360 degree sensor package. So we'll be able to really support the, the search and rescue. Uh, very good comm range uh, and also uh, enough electrical power. Our endurance, mm, not very high at all. Uh, four to, uh, out of a 20 to 25 minutes based upon the speed. So let's go through the rest of them, the selection criteria. Manual controller, auto controller. You know, I'm not that very good a pilot, so yeah, we're gonna go with auto control. Is everyone okay with that? Let's go for the camera. What camera system do we want to have? We, for this airplane, we have the two cameras to select from. Either, and the difference between them, uh, I think it's just weight. This one weighs 2.9 ounces uh, and has a 12x zoom and needs five volts. This camera, Whereas the weight 2.4 ounces and needs five volts. So very similar pieces of equipment. Okay, next question for the class, which one? Oh, and then we have an EOIR sensor. And I, let's see if we can put that on there. It weighs eight ounces. I don't know about that one, that's pretty heavy. And an infrared system, 31 ounces. Okay, can you pull up uh, question hole 11? Let's see what, given those specs and our mission for search and rescue, which sensor, which camera system are we gonna put out there? Infrared, infrared, infrared. Let's see if we can do it. Infrared sensor with the gimbal. Yep, well, let's go. Let's try the infrared. Uh, see if it's, it's the heaviest package. Uh, is it really eligible? Oops, oops. 
sorry, plants, no can do, no can do. Uh, that payload is in excess of the carrying capacity for this airplane. I apologize, we're going to have to go with the section choice, the uh, SE, oh, that's SE 600, SE 500, oops. Because we will not be able to make weight with that. Sensors, definitely, uh, believe we're gonna stick with triple, triple GPS modules. We're gonna need that for search and rescue out there and no, no challenges there. Don't need to put any fuel on because guess what? It's battery powered. No, no question there. Oh, just the last thing we need to do is figure out a battery pack. Can you pull up question 13, our last decision before we go out and fly this airplane? Tell me, poll 13, please. Let's figure out what kind of battery pack we have. The, the 2300 weighs less, but has less power to it less power, it weighs eight ounces. The largest battery pack, 10,000, weighs 8.8 .8 ounces. The one in the middle weighs 8.6 ounces. Ooh, definitely, given the juice, the 10,000 amp battery pack. Oh, no, 5,600, we're gonna trade off weight. Hmm, very interesting, very interesting. With 80% in, it looks like we're gonna go with the, try out the 5,600, less weight, uh, still good endurance, should give us good flight time. Let's see how it works out. All right, we have enough electrical power. Ooh, look at that. Our flight time definitely increased. I think we have a very smart class here. Good choice, good choice. All right, so we have an airplane now. Uh, let's go see if we can fly this guy. But before we fly it, we come over to Flight Planner. I need everyone, I'm gonna, we're gonna go through a walkthrough of the flight plan. So there is under the Padlet link that was in, in the chat discussion. Uh, Vanessa, if you can repost that. There's four different responses. The, the last four are gonna be uh, thumbs up to go. But before we get there, we need to go through the flight plan. So I have a pre-canned flight plan here. And uh, we need to walk through this flight plan, given the fact that each of the legs has a certain distance. And we better know a battery path. And we better make sure that we're flying high enough to clear the obstacles. So the standard operation for the simulator is going to be 300 uh, feet above the ground. That keeps us well below the legal limit of 400. And it looks like, as we go along, we can walk through each of the waypoints. The first waypoint is 300 feet above the ground. The next waypoint, and we're going to fly it at 20 knots. The distance for that leg is 768 feet. Not too bad. Let's go to waypoint two. Still looking. Is everyone good? Has anyone seen any issues? Any recommendations? Still going to fly 20 knots? That's a good speed for this aircraft. Uh, quadcopter really, that's a, that's a good speed. It'll give you a nice endurance and uh, longest range. Uh, waypoint three is uh, 300, uh, 390. Waypoint four. B56, waypoint five, and we're coming back home, man. Eh? 
with a flight that's about uh, 2,000 feet. So anyone have any issues at all so far? Anything? Give me a thumbs up if you think we're ready to go to, to pre-flight. Ready for flight? With the flight plan? Oh, got two thumbs up, three thumbs up, four thumbs up. Everybody's giving me a thumbs up. Well, let's go do this. It's there. So here we go. Okay, we have HUDs up. Oh, no, I can't believe it. Some, we didn't do our notice to airmen to find out if there is any events for the day that should keep us from flying. And lo and behold, in front of us, we uh, have a fire in front of us. So, oh no, are we gonna clear this? Are we gonna be safe flying through the smoke? Oh, it's going slow. I think we're gonna make it. Oh, battery life's looking good up here. And we can open up another one so we can monitor the flight plan from the hole. Oh, wow, look at that. We're going up on our first leg, yay. Does anybody see any missing hikers out there? Oh, looking good. No, can't find any hikers. Everybody's okay. What is that? Uh, we're making our uh, gaining through our first waypoint. Lo and behold, what's coming up? Oh, this is something's wrong. Something's wrong. What's happening here? Oh no! Oh no! Crash! Oh, okay. I need some help here. What happened? Give me some help. Get into the flight plan and, and, and give me some ideas. What went wrong? I know we ran in the tree, but I just don't get it. We were at 300 feet above the ground. Any suggestions from the, the troops? All right, well, let's go back and, and walk through our flight plan again. Something is awry. We crashed just about waypoint one, right? Let's look here. Waypoint one, the elevation increased, but we never increased our elevation from the starting point. We were 300 feet above the ground at starting point. When we got to this point here, we were no longer 300 feet above the ground because the elevation difference. Oh, can you believe it? I'm glad we're in a virtual world. So if this was the real world and that event happened, we would have to go and go through an accident reporting uh, system to let the, the agency know that while we didn't cause any serious damage, we did have an operational error. And pilots and operators do this in the aviation community because it's done under non-punitive, a non-punitive method, method so that they can gather information and statistics to allow us to create an environment that's safer in the future. So all this information comes together through the local agencies, then they go through and analyze it and they make rules and design changes on how you fly. So with this, we can easily fix this by changing the required alt attitude, altitudes and just give us a, a little bit more distance. Let's go up to 350 at the first waypoint. The second waypoint, let's go back up to 350. Keep it there. 
350. Let's double check all the numbers. Oops, it didn't take a 350. Something's wrong. There we go. Three, four. Oh, four, we need to be. 350 again. Oops. 350. What's this waypoint here? Double check. 350. 350. Three fifty, three hundred. All right, I think we should be good to go. Except we should have enough altitude now. Anybody have any other suggestions? All right, so Power propulsion, we're ready. Flight dynamics, uh, I think we got everything in place. Uh, we checked uh, NOTAMs this time, and uh, while we have a fire in place, we've adjusted our altitudes accordingly and should be clear to go. Payloads working, safety. Are we getting a thumbs up from it all? Let's try this again. Let's see if we can get through the flight. Here we go, ready for takeoff. Mission started. And let's go. We can talk about this here so you can get the UAV view, see the pilot view. Kind of nice. Turn the HUD on or off. I like to fly with the HUD on. Keeps me from getting scared from the smoke. In search and rescue, you have times where you need to operate in conditions like this. So you need to become aware of it. If you're out in search and rescue trying to find some firefighters that have uh, been lost or misplaced, uh, yeah, you're going to have to be able to navigate through these kind of things. Now we can follow it. We're sequencing up here in the upper corner through waypoint one. Lo and behold, are we going to make it this time? Looks good. So it's a trade-off. How high do you want to go to get visibility to what's on the ground to how far your clearance needs to be above your obstacles? A search and rescue, that's going to be a tough trade-off. But we realize how important flight planning is in order to make our mission successful. Uh-oh. I see something up ahead. Now, if we were flying this uh, in a real mission, we'd have manual override mode, OK? If you came up against an obstacle, you would hover. So we rightly chose a quadcopter. If you saw something, your payload operator will would uh, select the pilot in charge to go and uh, go off flight plan to maneuver manually. We're sequencing through waypoint three successfully. Things are looking good now.
battery charge, excellent, good choice. But do look, our comm link up here is, uh, is very low. And you can see the orientation of where we're at with respect to the, the ground station where we're, where we're controlling from, we're behind the hills. So it's good that we're flying a flight plan because if we were in a manual control, we could easily go uh, lost link. And then if we weren't on a, a flight plan, uh, the system would have to go to emergency, emergency actions. Okay. Coming up on waypoint four, five. Things are looking good. We haven't found the lost hiker yet, but we know that they aren't in our area of surveillance because we've been, oh, there they are. Look at them. Hi there. Don't worry. We've caught you. We'll be back for you. See them down there? So we have video feeds that are being recorded, that are being shipped back to the ground station. Uh, and they're also kept on, on memory on the, the machine. So now we can go back, we know where the, the hike, lost hiker is, and we can uh, perform our rescue. Everyone, successful mission, round of applause to you all. So with that, I'd like to open the floor up to the class to ask questions. We learned about the key factors in to mission uh, design. Uh, we understand the four forces. We understand what makes uh, generates the lift. We built a UAS in the virtual world. We flew it. First time, not so successful. But after that, we learned. And then our next mission was a success, and we found the lost hiker. Congratulations, and I'm opening the floor up to questions now. Don't be shy. Uh, hi, David. Thanks for the session. So we have a couple of questions asked by um, the participants. Okay. So one of it is actually regarding uh, this um, ARVL. So yes. I think there are people that are very impressed with this software. So what they're asking is, like, is it accessible on campus or online, and who can access it? Yes, uh, uh, it's accessible to our Embry-Riddle students, and uh, whether through the through the, the different course curriculums. So I don't believe it's a open uh, open source as of this time, but it would it is available through through other course curriculums. Okay. Uh, David, yeah, I, I actually picked out another question here from earlier. So someone is asking about you know aircraft like planes with propeller at the back of the plane. I think this might be called pusher aircraft. Do you just want to know how does this work? What was that again? Aircraft uh, planes with, with propeller at the back of the planes. You see oh the yeah, front. pusher planes. Yeah, how, how yeah, does it yeah, work? That, uh, it's, the same, it's the same design where you're using Newton's principles where the air, the propellers turned, the propeller blades are turned the opposite way, so they create, as they spin, they create the force pushing forward. So instead of the airplane, the, the engine being at the front and the propeller in the front, pulling the airplane, it works in the back and it pushes the airplane. So pusher or puller systems, the same principles apply. The propeller itself is a moving, think of it as a moving wing. It's creating the lift the, the, and, and the pressure difference and, it's cre and that creates the force that allows the airplane to move. Oh, all right, that's good. Uh, I think we okay. have a few more questions here in the chat as well. Let's see, let's take a look. Uh, sorry, uh, there's another yeah. question. So someone is okay. asking to explain the difference between longest flight distance and longest flight time. Uh, How can they achieve these targets when designed? Correct. So the next level of analysis that was significantly deeper here is the understanding of the, the curve associated with uh, drag, the drag curves. 
And there's a point, the curve goes, starts at one point, it goes down as you increase speed, and then it goes back up, okay? That point at the bottom of the bell curve, that point there is the lift to drag, uh, max lift to drag ratio. That point represents the speed that will provide you the longest endurance for your airplane. So you look at the lift of the drag curve and you pull off the two different points. And that's something that we teach in uh, Aerodynamics 309. It's a third year level course. So I hope that helps a little bit, but it is, it's the ratio of lift to drag. Okay, uh, we have another question as well. Um, for forest fire monitor, would a fixed wing be acceptable? Before, and, and it goes back to your mission. Remember, we chose a quadcopter, which would allow us to stop and, and do hovering and get into very tight spaces. A fixed wing would be uh, fully acceptable if you wanted to go longer, uh, uh, get the maximum range. So your versatility will go down. You couldn't go down into a canyon space with a fixed wing because your turn radius, uh, in order to, to stay in flight, uh, might interact with the, the canyon walls and things like that. But from in general, fixed wings uh, can be used and it just meant it's up to your mission. So there are quite a few nice fixed wing uh, uh, SUAVs that can have flight times up to 40 to 50 minutes and cover a, a fairly long range. All right, I think we have one more question. Okay. Um, yeah, this, there's a question on, let's say there's a real life situation uh, for the quadcopter. Uh, will we trade off battery power for better communication equipment? Is, is it better what? Will we uh, trade power? off the battery power for better uh, communication equipment? Yeah, <laughs> you saw in our flight, we lost comm. We almost lost comm. But we were on a, a, an automatic flight plan, which allow us, allow us to stay en route, okay? So yeah, that is really, do you need, to, your answer, the question back to your question is, do you need tele telemetry or not? Do you need to actively know where you're at and pre providing feedback down? So yes, you would upgrade your communications power in order to get longer distance for both data and control but you do that at, at the expense of some flight time. But when your mission calls for it, you, you can make you can, should make it happen. Very good. Any more any more questions? Uh, David, there's someone who's asking what is talk. I think just now when we were in a lab, there was this part that talks about talk. So someone's asking what is talk. That's the force that's, uh, that the, the engine creates in terms of horsepower is the energy and torque is the actual force that's creating uh, through the propeller. Foot pounds of force. So it's a, a, it's a way to measure how much continued force you, you can apply to create the speed that you're looking for to overcome the drag. All right, uh, actually I think we do not have any more questions here. So yeah, I think it's about time, okay. So basically, I think, thank, thank you. Thanks, David, uh, for sharing all this with us this morning. Um, well, if any one of you have any more questions, uh, you know, especially about our admission process as well as the program, uh, I will still be here, okay, uh, to answer any of your questions. So if we do not have any more questions for uh, David here, uh, so we would like to end this session and let's like thank all of you for being here with us this morning or, you know, whatever time it is for you, where you are. 
Okay, all right. So very good. Thank you. So uh, hey, if you class, don't, hey, yeah, yeah. Thumbs up you, to you all. You did a great job today. I hope you guys Happy enjoy. Happy flying. See you. All right. Uh, for those of you, of you to, who do not have any questions for us regarding the programs and the emissions and all that, uh, please feel free to actually leave now uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. So for those who are still around, if you have any questions for me here regarding the program about MB Riddle or the emission process, you know, feel free to just ask uh, any of the questions here right now. Let's take a look. Well, it appears that we don't have anyone here who have any questions for us. Uh, so in this case, okay, uh, we will be ending this session soon. Um, well, everyone we will be receiving an email from us uh, pretty soon with the video recording of this session. So thank you once uh, again. Kelvin, yep. Kelvin, there's one question. Oh, yes. May I please yes. know about the Embry Riddle business courses? Let's see. It's just one. All right. Yes, uh, we do have uh, business courses. Uh, is there anything in particular you want to know about the business courses, or should I just go through uh, the entire thing about the business course with you? Is it? Uh, I'm reading the chat right now. I mean, Michael, do we want to uh, give them a uh, mute, mute him perhaps so he can ask the question directly? Yes, let's do that. Okay, uh, they can unmute themselves now. Um, good morning. Hi, morning. I mean, I'm in India, so it's still morning for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just wanted to know about like economics and business, uh, how the course works and um, maybe uh, how long is the duration and about Embry Riddle, how like are the scholarships? Oh, all right. Okay. So basically, um, I'll answer here for the HR campus here. Uh, we do have the uh, Aviation Business Administration program. So uh, basically this uh, three and a half year program, yeah, if you're doing it on campus full time here in Singapore, uh, the program itself typically will be talking a lot on uh, business uh, topics. Okay? Think of it as a business degree, but uh, we actually uh, infuse it with uh, topics on, on aviation. Okay? So that will enable you to have a very good grasp of the uh, business you know, management principles, your uh, uh, business topics, as well as you know, uh, a very good idea, an uh, in-depth idea of uh, aviation specific. So if you're looking to work in more of the research uh, or the business side okay, of aviation, okay, then, then this can be a very good uh, way for you to actually get exposed to it. All right. For scholarship itself, for Embry though, uh, first off, usually I will share with you that you know, we do not offer a full scholarship, okay, which means that uh, for you students who are eligible, okay, typically we uh, base our scholarship on academic merit. So you are required to achieve a certain GPA uh, if you are applying with your high school diploma, okay, uh, to be eligible for scholarship. 
So partial scholarship here typically are range anything from five to twenty percent of your of the tuition fee. So that will depend on your academic merit. The higher your merit, okay, uh, the higher tier of scholarship that you might be able to get. Okay. Oh, actually, I see. I hope that answers your question. Okay. If not, please, you know, <laughs> uh, let me know. Uh, because I see here, and I, we have another question. I'm not sure whether I can help you on that. On uh, how feasible is it, uh, in for flight tracking for aircraft currently in the industry? I see David is still here. I'm not sure whether David is able to help with this. Uh, the question here is how feasible is you know, flight tracking for aircraft currently in the industry. I'm not sure I understand that as so. well. Anyone able to answer? If you want to unmute, uh, Ahmed, uh, yeah, so. I don't know whether it was tracking somebody else or tracking the UAS. Yeah, I don't have the answer on AVRL being available outside the college. So uh, I'd have to look into that one, guys. So it's, it's usually it's usually part of a, a PE SUS 1100 series uh, course. All right, so uh, I don't think we have any more questions right now. We'll be uh, ending this session. Okay, so yeah, we have our contact information on screen. So if we anyone have any more questions after this, feel free to just drop us an email. So thank you everyone. And that's a goodbye for us.